The following is a production of the Leonine Institute for Catholic Social Teaching. For more information, please visit leoinstitute.org. We'll go ahead and get started. So thanks everyone for coming. Um, I guess we'll start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, remind us that you said that the worker deserves his wages. And give us your grace to study your word, and especially in this case, to study uh, and understand uh, the teaching of your church with respect to social matters. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So <clears throat> tonight I want to talk about the just wage and give a little idea of um, uh, some theoretical stuff. I guess we'll start off with the theoretical aspect of it. Uh, what, is, what is a wage specifically and what is a just wage? So understanding sort of the scientific aspect of it from an economic standpoint, um, such as it is scientific, but, um, and then understanding uh, the idea of a just wage. Then moving on uh, and talking about uh, <clears throat> some problems that I think there are with um, the, the idea of solving the problem of an insufficient wage or a wage that's not just because it's too low. Okay, and we'll even mention the idea of a, just being, or a wage being unjust because it's too high. Um, and then we'll talk about a couple of um, ideas that I have, some policy ideas that I have that I think make sense given economic theory and given what, what I expect to happen in a market when, um, when we make some kind of change sort of from a top-down point of view um, such that it would give us uh, something um, consistent with uh, the notion of the just wage. And so what is a, what is a just wage? Well, to start off, well, you need to understand what a wage is. So a wage is uh, compensation for the service of human work in the context of a firm. Okay, so um, <clears throat> my son is, my oldest son is 12, and he has been diligently mowing our neighbor's yard all summer. And he has been paid for this, but he was not paid a wage. Okay, he's been paid for a service as an independent businessman, right? Uh, there's no firm that's binding him with my neighbor such that the compensation he's being paid would be a wage, okay? Um, so inside of a firm, in the context of a firm, the firm itself has to pay for its factors of production, inputs and that sort of thing. Um, and one of those inputs is labor, and that comes from, uh, comes from a person uh, directly instead of it being a product that someone produces and then sells. Um, <clears throat> so in technical economics, you know, we have our supply and demand graph here, um, and on the vertical axis is always price. It's always the sort of independent variable in economics, and I'm told that that's backwards from the real sciences. But um, <clears throat> so we have the price, which is sort of the outcome of the process we're describing here. And then we have a quantity of labor, uh, labor hours maybe, or number of people who are working in this market. And then we have the supply curve and the demand curve. So the supply curve represents the cost um, of entering this labor market, the cost of that thing. And normally when we think of supply curves, if you've taken an econ course, normally when you see a supply curve, you think of a business. You know, that they're the ones supplying something. Well, in this case, the supply comes from the worker, okay? So the worker is cognizant of their cost, their opportunity cost, how much it, it costs them to spend an extra hour at work instead of an extra hour doing something else. Uh, the demand side, the blue curve there, indicates the uh, benefit or the desirability or the willingness to pay for that labor from the firm. Okay, and we can go into things like why one's sloping up and one's sloping down and all of that sort of thing. But it's not too, you know, it's, I don't think we need to get into that. It's not too important to do that right now. Um, if you have questions about it, we can do that. So where are these two things, the cost and the benefit, intersect? Uh, there is the equilibrium amount of labor that gets done and the wage at which it's done. Okay. And... I'm introducing this because when we get to the policy stuff, this is going to be important for understanding why, at least in my mind, there's a preference for certain things over others. Okay. Um, and of course, this is overly basic. Uh, some of my colleagues might 
uh, throw things at me because I'm not using a sort of monopolistic competition idea and all this sort of thing. But um, I, I, again, I think we're okay just given the basics. Um, so where do we get the idea of a just wage? So let's put that word just in front of the wage. Um, <clears throat> in rerum novarum, so of course I'm uh, constantly referencing that encyclical throughout this because you know, this is where uh, we kind of get our modern idea of, um, of, of the social teaching of the church. So Pope Leo XIII expresses a strong preference for wages to be determined via mutual agreement between employer and employee. Um, so this is sort of my summary of it. He, he, and again, uh, strong, uh, let's see, what did I say? Strong preference for it. Um, it's not the essential thing that, di that dictates whether a wage is just or not because it's agreed to. Okay, so he's preferring this uh, we can think sort of in, in uh, because of a, a reference to something fundamental that we talked about in the first lecture. So we talked about subsidiarity, right? Preferring the lowest and most local level, uh, allowing decisions to be made at that level because that's where it's appropriate. We shouldn't prefer a larger or more distant body making a decision uh, where they don't need to. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So in accord with subsidiarity, we prefer that this be a sort of, um, you know, uh, an agreed upon thing. However, um, you know, Pope Leo is, is careful to state that the agreement itself, okay, is not sufficient to, to declare that wage that's arrived at as a just wage. Okay, so merely because we agree on it um, is, not, uh, is not sufficient. Voluntary agreement as the basis of justice is a liberal ideal, uh, not a teaching of the church. Okay, this is part of political ideology. This is part of uh, liberal philosophy. Okay? This, is not, um, this is not in accord with the teaching of the church. So agreeing on things is obviously good. It, it promotes uh, peace. It promotes uh, good order. Um, it promotes the common good. But it's possible for those agreements to go wrong, okay? Um, <clears throat> so just to put a little bit of legs underneath that, so inasmuch as we are free to agree to things, that freedom comes from God, okay? Our freedom to uh, contract with each other, as we heard in the second lecture, the freedom that we have to do that comes from God. Well, think about it. Who is the freest being? If freedom is a good thing, and all good things from, come from God. God is the perfection of all good things, right? So God must be the freest being. But God doesn't commit evil, right? He doesn't sin. Christ didn't sin when he was here. And so freedom consists in our ability to choose the good. That's our freedom, okay? Not the ability to do whatever we want. See where I'm coming from there? <clears throat> So practically speaking, you know, Pope Leo is writing this uh, encyclical. It's published in 19, 19, or excuse me, 1891, 1891. And he expresses sort of qualified support for labor unions. Um, there's some differences between the US and Europe with respect to how labor unions are being used at the time. In Europe, they're very um, politically engaged in the sense that they're sort of pushing this idea of Marxism and all this sort of thing. And, of course, the Pope is not in favor of that. He explicitly says he's not. Um, but labor unions as a bargaining tool, as a backstop for the, when this agreement between the employer and employee might not go correctly. Okay. He laments, though, the demise of the guild, okay, so from the, the, the prior age, from before the industrial age, uh, the sort of artisan concept um, where we have a a master and an apprentice, and the apprentice leaves his family and goes to the master and learns the craft, right, and then becomes a master craftsman himself, okay? And we preserve these terms to some extent. If you go into like a, uh, into a trade that's heavily unionized, you have these levels, apprentice and journeyman and master, right? Um, but, <clears throat> um, you know, Pope Leo is not, um, I guess, filled with nostalgia, okay? He's not saying we have to bring back the guilds, okay? 
but <clears throat> he prefers them because there's a solidarity. Okay, so going back to the first lecture, there's a solidarity in the guild structure among the worker or the, the, the subordinate, right, the apprentice, and the master. They're both part of this guild that sort of regulates the trade. Whereas in the modern world, or in the more modern world, right, in 1891, we have a situation where he's, he's looking around and he's saying, well, gosh, well, we have, uh, you know, we have these labor unions, and I guess they're okay, you know, I guess they're pretty good. Um, they're just a poor substitute. But it's something. It's something to put a backstop on this agreed-upon wage. He says explicitly, and I, and I, I reviewed a book um, a couple years ago, I reviewed a book called Can a Catholic Be a Socialist? And you know, with my book reviews, I'm, I'm always very nice. I'm a, I'm a real moderate guy, right, Mark? And so, <laughs> uh, one of the things where I really, <laughs> I really beat up on the, the authors of this book um, was, you know, they, they talked a lot about this idea that, you know, gosh, there's just no support for government intervention in labor markets. Or there's very little, or, you know, we have to, we have, to have all these other things happen before we will ever allow that. Well, I think that's silly. Um, Pope Leo says that, you know, the wage, a wage is sort of the, the way we measure the justice of the economy in general. Okay? So we talked about property. We're going to talk about usury next week. All of these things, you know, to some extent are influenced by this wage concept. If we have a just wage, a lot of other things can go right. We can rely on subsidiarity in a lot bigger way. We don't have to go to a higher and higher level uh, if a just wage is just paid. If the employers are informed, if they're, and I'll get to that in a minute. But, um, so the state intervention in wages is allowable, but it's better, it's preferred that we not have to do that. The just wage is a level of compensation that allows a man to provide a sensible living for his family. And this is where um, one of my favorite economists, and, and I think myself as well, would probably get into trouble uh, talking about this sort of thing. So notice I said um, it's, it's for a man to provide for his family. Right? And I wasn't speaking in the sort of old term of saying man as humanity, but specifically the male. Okay. Um, so this wage is not, uh, and I'll, I guess I'll, I'll get to that here in a second, but um, <laughs> it's not bare subsistence, okay? So this is not just supposed to be um, the, the, the bottom line, the, the absolute minimum that you would need to stay alive, okay? Um, it requires, to some extent, uh, a frugality on the part of the wage earner, okay? It's stipulated that... You know, the life that this wage is supposed to provide is something that is common to a lot of people. So, not bare subsistence. It should allow, uh, the Pope says, that, uh, that, <clears throat> that um, the wage earner is able to amass some property for himself. Okay? So, it's good for us to have property. It's good for us to have our own physical things that can generate a return as well. And not just rely on a wage. Um, in my view, a just wage allows for engagement in the community, participation in the parish, uh, you know, leisure, good leisure, not just, you know, staring at screens, right? Um, and the accrual of property, okay? I think I missed a note in here. So, um, you know, one of the things I want to say about this family aspect um, is that... <clears throat> Uh, another, another recent book on the social teaching of the church, uh, sort of very uh, uh, strange title, called Cathonomics, okay? Uh, and I wrote a review of this one, too. <laughs> and, I was, and I was even less nice about that one. But um, <clears throat> he talks about the idea that, you know, Pope Leo, Pope Leo XIII, is, you know, his, he has some good ideas, but gosh, you know, it's just this, this paternalism that the author of this book doesn't like. Ooh, that's bad, in his mind. And it seems like a strange thing, you know, for a religion that has a pope that's, you know, a guy. And we call him Papa, right? <laughs> seems sort of strange to complain about paternalism in that sense. And, uh, you know, I'm not, and I'm not saying that, like, you know, women shouldn't work at all, but I'm saying 
Pope Leo, and I think rightly, and I think today it doesn't matter what you know, the customs of the age are, uh, or whining about paternalism, um, it should be the case that one parent works, and, and I'll get into some practicality of this later, but it should be the case. One parent works, and so then the other can take care of children. They can manage the household. They can help manage engagement in the community, right? They can build the bonds of the neighborhood, right? It's a little wonder that, you know, people don't engage with their neighbors anymore. Well, nobody's ever home, right? You have two parents working, and the kids are off at the school down the street or wherever. Nobody's ever home. How are you going to get to know anybody anyway? What's the purpose of a front porch if nobody's there until 8 o'clock at night, right? Or maybe 6 o'clock, and then everybody just eats dinner, right? And they get back to their screens, and then they go to sleep way too late, right? I have some problems with modern world, you know. <laughs> just a few. Just a very short list of 100 or 200 pages. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> Economist, so uh, the late economist Rupert Ederer, um, who I have a, uh, a lot of appreciation for, He's, uh, he wrote the book that I mentioned before that was very expensive, um, and I think that's sad, but um, he said that <clears throat> there's, this, there's this sort of modern idea of a living wage, because you know, we can't talk about a just wage, right? As, as Mark treated us to in the second lecture, you know, we're all very concerned about the two ships running into each other. We're never worried about having the, the ship right or knowing where we're going, right? So we can't define justice because that's, that's too far, right? It's above, it's above our pay grade or something. So they have this idea of a living wage, which is sort of like a facsimile of it, a sort of sanitized version. And he, and he talks about the fact that you know, universities and governments had been computing this. I mean, it's not hard to figure out. You know, you put a basket of things that you need that, are, that the average family is going to need. How much does that stuff cost in a given area? How much does it cost to have a house or an apartment, right, that's big enough for people to live in? How much does it cost to have a car or something, you know, some kind of transportation, things that you need, okay, and not bare subsistence, but also not uh, the fanciest thing, right? We can, we can come up with a number for that. That's not hard. And so he says that you know, even the fact that even someone who you wouldn't think necessarily would be concerned about this can come up with that and sort of when we compare two sources for what we compute to be a living wage, they sort of agree with each other. And so he says, you know, this is a very intelligible thing. It's a very basic thing for us, right? It's just addition and subtraction. I think this would be a great project for a master's student in economics or data science or something. You know, write an, write an algorithm to scrape all these prices together, you know, and have a, an idea of a just wage in all these locations. So 40 years after Rerum Novarum, Pope Pius XI writes Quadragesimo Anno, or however you pronounce it, it means the 40th year, okay, so 40 years after Rerum Novarum. There used to be, a, every 10 years there was a celebration um, after the, the publishing of, of Rerum Novarum. And so he writes... Um, a, a long encyclical, but a very good one. Um, and so he adds to it, and he says, look, you know, 40 years later, how are things going? How are things going in 1931, um, given what, we're, what we want to expect, what we expect about a just wage or other things? And he, he kind of floats the idea of profit sharing or employee-owned firms and we see those things every once in a while. I think there's a grocery store around here that's employee-owned. I think it's Hy-Vee, right? Um, and we see profit-sharing types of things. In a lot of jobs, you have you know, what we call a 401k, right? And we talked about that last time in the Q&A section, I think. Um, but sort of, I guess there could be a, you know, explicit profit-sharing, you know, giving you um, uh, 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 an equity stake in the business that you work for, right? Um, and he says, you know, that this, these sorts of things might help us ad achieve a just wage or get closer to it because he thinks we haven't made enough progress that way in the last 40 years. We hadn't gotten to that point. He also brings the idea of the common good uh, into the discussion a lot more fully. And he talks about the idea that it could be the case that someone's wages might be too high 
because it would impede on the ability of the firm to pay a just wage to those that are less skilled or less productive in the firm. Right, again, this is sort of very obsessed with productivity here, right? In, uh, in the economics terms where uh, the wage is equal to the marginal value product, okay? It's, the wage is equal to the contribution that you can bring to the firm's revenue. Well, okay, but that may or may not be just. Okay. Just because we could do it doesn't mean that it's just. And so he says um, that some of, the, some of those who are highly paid might, uh, it might be good from the firm's point of view to pay them less so that others can be paid more. And he's sort of taking a dig, it seems, at unions a little bit, you know, because some of the union wages seem excessively high, at least at his time. So uh, I want to make one last comment on <laughs> this idea of, uh, sort of defend myself a little bit more on this idea of the, the paternalism, right? Um, so it's certainly true that the more recent uh, uh, encyclicals on this topic, on, on the topic of um, the social teaching of the church, have also talked about things like, um, you know, education for girls and, you know, things like that. Like, we've got to educate girls when they're younger, and especially we're thinking, this is much more recent, the last 40 years or so, when, we're, when, the, when the encyclicals start to focus more outside of, uh, you know, Europe and the United States. They start focusing on middle, what we call middle and low-income countries, right? Um, but again, there's nothing in there that says that this sort of two-parent working household is some ideal, that there's something that has fundamentally changed about the nature of men and women such that men shouldn't be providing uh, from a sort of outside of the home perspective. So, anyway, enough of my defense on that. Um, <clears throat> so, there are some proposals that you are potentially familiar with um, when it comes to this idea of... Um, Dealing with insufficient wages, dealing with wages that are too low. And so one of them we have is, you know, raising the minimum wage. And back when I was in college, it was the, uh, it was like the fight for 15, maybe this was when I was in grad school, but like maybe 10 years ago, the fight for 15, right? Y'all ever hear about that one? And now it's, I think the number that's being floated is closer to 20, I'm understanding. And, you know, if you want to do some quick math in your head, you take 2,000, times the hourly, weight that pe hourly rate that people are talking about, and that gives you a sort of annual number. So $20 an hour, that's $40,000 a year. Is that enough? I don't know. Uh, one of my problems with this is if we, especially if we do this sort of thing at the national level, we have a lot of problems. Because a dollar in Mississippi buys a whole lot more than a dollar in, you know, the coast on, in California or New York City. And so they're not the same thing. $20 in one place might be uh, too low. And $20 in another place might be uh, absurdly generous to the extent that it would sort of collapse the economy. Uh, when I talk about this wage stuff, I talk about a friend of mine who runs a business installing fence. And he lives in a small town in southeast Kansas, which I call the Appalachia of Kansas in a very, uh, very nice way. I, I love southeast Kansas. That's where I'm from. Um, but it is a, but it is a, you know, a relatively, it has its problems. It has its problems. And that's unfortunate. Um, but from financially is one of them. Um, but he pays a, a very good wage, I think, for his area. He pays pretty good money to the managers of his firm. And, you know, it's something like the mid-20s, I think. And in Yates Center, Kansas, you can make a pretty good life with 20, 25 bucks an hour. So what happens if we have a national minimum of 20? What happens to his ability to even have a workforce there? I mean, his manager's gonna be like, hey, last year, my wage was 25, and it was you know, more than triple the minimum. Now the minimum's right underneath me, and I'm worried about inflation and all these other things. I'm worried about the cost of everything going up, right? Or cost push inflation. 
So I think this is a, is a blunt instrument. It's like killing a fly with a sledgehammer. It's just silly. It doesn't make sense. And, and remember, a very important thing here is the morality of the agreement in the first place. So simply putting a, a, a requirement on everyone, it misses the opportunity for employer and employee to come to a, an agreement on a just wage. It, it totally obviates that whole thing. It eliminates it. So I say, you know, it drives a wedge between the employer and the employee. And it might push a lot of people out of work who should be at work. This is one of the things we talk about um, on this graph. If we have a minimum wage, that means the price is mandated at a certain level. And if it's mandated above the equilibrium, then what we get is a surplus. Okay? We get a lot more supplied than we do demanded. And in this case, that's a little scary because what that means is there's a bunch of people that want to work for that higher wage, but they can't find a job because nobody wants to employ them. And there are all these arguments to sort of deal with this. Uh, well, you know, your graph is wrong because it's not a monopoly. And well, you know, it turns out if we just if we just cut away all these workers and we invest in all this wonderful technology, then everybody's life gets better somehow. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Um. <laughs> so another one is uh, this idea of, let's see, yeah, mandatory paid maternity leave. So here we're not necessarily fully addressing the problem of the just wage, but sort of in the sense that Pope Pius XI is saying, gosh, you know, maybe we could add something here or there to try to make things better. We can add some profit sharing. We can look at employee-owned companies a little more. So this is not a, like a, a, a sort of panacea, a full solution to the problem, but it's something to, intended to try to fix some of it. Okay? And <clears throat> I have a couple problems with this, and the first one is just sort of the logic of it. Um, so if you think about this, what it does is it, um, it, it kind of says something to the family. It says, look, uh, whatever this mandatory paid maternity leave we mandate from the government, whatever the government says this period of time should be, okay, whether it's six months of paid leave or nine or 12 or however many, okay, it sort of implies that that's enough. See? Sort of like the law is our teacher. And it's teaching us in this sense that, you know, that's it. That's all you need. And so, in my mind, it sort of reduces the cost of employing people. It reduces our opportunity cost. It says, you know, I'm happy to be out here in the workforce because I get time off when I need it. I get my maternity leave when I need it. You see what I'm saying? Mark had a light bulb go off. I can see yeah, more. I can figure out where you're going with that. Yeah, yeah. And that makes sense. So if we think about this, this blue curve, this blue curve is going to come down. And what is that going to do? It's going to put downward pressure on the wages. We're going to have more two-income families. Right? Because now, oh, it's okay. Everybody's got 12 months of maternity leave. So you can just, you know, go make PowerPoints for global corporation. And you can still be good parents. You're still good parents because you have nine months or whatever to take care of an infant. Eh, I'm not going to buy it, okay? I don't think that's enough. And look, you know, I, I recognize, I mean, I'm uh, very fortunate to be in a situation where my wife has been at home with our kids the whole time. Um, and you do the math and it's like, gosh, you know, what would it cost for her to enter the workforce, right? How much would it change things for us? We'd make more money, but gosh, you know, be a lot of downsides. Because we started this way. You know, it's sort of like this, um, oh, what do you call it? Uh, path dependency. We started off this way, and so we just keep going. We don't, we don't have to make our budget shrink to pull someone out of the workforce. She was never there in the first place. And so we've just built our budget around only one. It's easy. It's easier, I guess, psychologically. <clears throat> the other problem is that 
there's sort of this pernicious effect because think about that. Who has to do the nine months of work or 12 or whatever the number is when this new mother leaves the workforce? She leaves her job, whatever that job is. Well, somebody's got to do that stuff, presumably, right? Assuming it was, you know, productive stuff. I mean, we assume it was productive in some sense because, again, uh, there was some benefit, the orange line, estimated by the one paying them. So who pays her? Who, who, sorry, who does that work? Well, my understanding, and this is not scientific, this is a conversation I had with someone who lived in Canada for a while. My understanding is that in Canada, where they have this sort of manda mandated thing, you get this kind of temp class, this underclass of temp worker, who doesn't have any kind of stability with their firm, the stability that Pope Leo would have really liked. You know, the idea that, that your employer is doing good by paying you a just wage. And so you have some kind of, I guess we call this in economics, repeated dealings, right? That's why we have brands and stuff, because we want, it, it builds trust. It allows us to have confidence in the quality of something. So we don't want people to have to jump from job to job to job in the modern world. That's stressful. It, it, it doesn't accord with peace and leisure, right? And so this policy just creates this. It invents or, ex, or expands this temp class. And I think that's a, a downside that we don't like. So <clears throat> I'm going to give a little bit of data. You all thought you were going to get through this whole thing with an economist and not have a single chart. It's not going to happen. <laughs> I'm not going to let it happen. Uh, so this first one, uh, this is labor force participation in the United States of women from, uh, I don't know, like 1950, late 1940s. That's when we started keeping track of everything, the World War II thing, um, up until the present. And labor force participation basically means, and I'm going to give a rough thing here, but it's like the number of people who are at working age that are actually working divided by the total number of people that are of working age. Does that make sense? So this is like all the working women above 18 divided by all women who are above 18. Or, I mean, we break these things down. Sometimes we'd say 25 to 54 age. We call that the prime age working, the prime, prime working age. So you can see the trend here. You can see in the 50s, the 60s, in the 70s, we have this massive uptick in labor force participation among women. And I, it's probably a little small to see the details, but um, if you're really interested in this, I'll give you the, the numbers later. I'll give you a link. Um, and you, but you can just see here's how dramatically that increases. And over the same time period, we see that labor force participation among men does exactly the opposite. Right? And not a... <laughs> And, and not a mirror image, but it's a reduction. It's awful. In some sense. I mean, part of this is a sort of uh, increase in our ability to, you know, have leisure or whatever, I suppose. But here, this, I think, is kind of really tells the whole story all in one little chart. So this is from, I believe it's from Pew. Um, and we see here, we have this massive change in society where we start off in this time frame, let's see, what is it, 1960. We start off in 1960 with a lot of single income father households. So a few things about this. The data is only on married households, so two parent married households with children, okay? So we're leaving a lot of people out of this. And if you think about it, over this time period, there's actually more and more households that aren't in this data set because they're single parent households, right? Divorce, just sort of single motherhood without marriage in the first place, right? Cohabitation, and that's not gonna be in here either, right? Non-married cohabitation. So we're missing a lot. But we've got something here. Even in the married households, so we think like perhaps might be the most stable, because, you know, there's a legal agreement, they're married, and they've got children, so there's an incentive to be stable here. And you see the transformation. 
At the beginning of this time series, we have most of these households are men working and providing for their family. And over time, we see this massive rise of two-income families. Pretty sharp rise, too, over this time period. And then it sort of levels off for quite a while. And why? I'm not exactly sure why. A lot of it has to do with, um, in this part, uh, sort of the biology of upper body strength and the ability in the 1980s to push a button on a computer to earn a wage rather than have to pick up a shovel in the 1950s. You see the difference there. So as we are less and less relying on upper body strength for work, we create this opportunity here, right? And that opportunity leads to this, which is not to the good, okay, from Pope Leo's point of view. And even Senator Elizabeth Warren, maybe you think of some nicknames that she was given by another politician here in the U.S., even her, the sort of progressive left, okay, back when she was a lowly academic, she wrote this book with her daughter called The Two-Income Trap. And what is this book about? Well, it's sort of very nerdy academic stuff about uh, probability of um, going bankrupt, like a bankrupt household. And essentially what they argue at least my interpretation of it, is that if you have a single income family, and a family meaning a married family and that sort of thing, if one of the adults in the room is not working, then you build your life around one income. And then if something happens, if things change, as they sort of increasingly do, recessions and jobs going away and all of this sort of thing, then what's nice about it is while that recently unemployed adult in the household is looking for work, the other one can try to find something to sort of piece enough money together to maintain and not go bankrupt. So 20 years ago, you know, Elizabeth Warren was like a reactionary, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> She, she lamented this two-income trap. I think she still does, but I, I, I think in some sense her party has pushed her away from the legitimate uh, solutions to this problem, in my mind. <clears throat> so yet more data. Um, this absolutely lovely study that I'm a huge fan of. Um, this gentleman, Oren Cass, left the Manhattan Institute and started his own outfit called American Compass. And they do some good data work. I'm not a huge fan of all of it. Obviously, I don't endorse everything that they do. But this, the first thing that they came up with, I think is fantastic. And it's called the Cost of Thriving Index. And so Cass says, look, there's a lot of problems with inflation measures and trying to use an inflation measure to arrive at an understanding of the uh, changes in wages over time. And what we ought to do is come up with a list of things that are concrete that people need or that, they're, that is common for our lives today and look at the cost of those things over time just purely in what we call in economics nominal terms. Okay, so we're not trying to adjust it for inflation and having all these problems with hedonic adjustments and all this other garbage. Okay? And so what he does is he gets this list of items here. Uh, so uh, a semester of college, um, I think the transportation is just like the price of a car sort of amortized over a few years or something like that. Um, health insurance, you know, how much does it take to provide insurance for a family for their basic health? Um, not that health insurance today is really insurance. It's not, it's not um, a payment for the possibility of a future uncertain event. It's just prepaying for care, right, if we have these comprehensive care plans. Um, and then at the bottom, housing. <clears throat> and so what he, sorry, what he says there, oh yeah, well, you know, I feel comfortable here, so I can say what I want. 
Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, put it in those words, right? Um, so you can see at the beginning, the cost of all these things added up is below that black line. And what is that black line? It's the median male wage in the United States. Okay, the median male wage. Why median? Well, it's the one in the middle. It's not the average because averages get sort of skewed. Okay, we have a statistician in the room, thankfully. But the median is, is very nice. It's like if we line up everybody from lowest wage to highest, we pick the guy in the middle, that's his wage. Okay? So we can see what happens over time, is that the cost of those four things that we think are nice, that people sort of need in a, in a world like this, not in the world of 1250, not in the world of 1891 necessarily, but you know, in the year of our Lord, 2023, these are good things to have. These are sensible things for a sensible family to have. Not extravagant, not ridiculous, basics. You can see what happens is that we get those four things go right up to the level of the median wage. And in fact, I, I'm not even sure why they did this this way because if you look at the numbers, it actually goes above that. Now this is a lot to put on a slide, okay? And I'm committing like PowerPoint evil. So I apologize. <laughs> But if you just look right here, I'll sort of do my Vanna White impression. Um, man, that's an old joke, isn't it? Like, who's Vanna White? <laughs> Oy, man. <laughs> so you have, this is the addition of the four items, okay? And then you can see here, this is the, the median male wage. Um, and so the, the cost of thriving index basically says how many weeks does the median male have to work to provide these four things, okay? And you can see at the beginning, it's like, what is this? 30 weeks. So 30 out of the 52 weeks of the year it takes to provide those four things. And now it's uh, 53, which I believe <laughs> is bigger than 52. Without Christmas. Yeah, and you don't even get any time off now. Isn't this incredible? This is a huge problem. So then if we look at the, the average female wage, it's even worse, uh, 65 weeks a year. You know, now, we're, now we're way well beyond 52. And then if we average the two of them together, we get 58 and a half. I don't really know why they do that. I mean, whatever. I don't even know what that means. I guess if you have two, but if you have two incomes, you, I don't know. Anyway, the bottom line is, this sort of presents us with a reason why We got this. Necessity. If we want to have a normal life, we want to have a sensible life, okay? We don't want to run up 17 credit cards to 20 grand each, okay? We don't want to drive a Maserati. We don't want to live in a 46 bedroom house on the coast, okay? We want a normal house. We want to live in a sensible place. And I could talk about all kinds of things, like the average square footage per person in a house has gone up dramatically over this time period as well. And so in some sense, that sort of justifies the increase in the housing cost. Okay. Um, the, there's a fantastic book called Mutual Aid and the Welfare State. Everyone should read this. It's, it's, it's just a delightful read, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's pretty tough stuff. But he tells a story. The author tells a story of how healthcare used to work in the US. And a lot of it was if you had a job, you had a fraternal society attached to that job. And that fraternal society provided a physician to you. So for instance, uh, he gives a great example in Topeka, Kansas. Y'all are familiar with that place, right? There was a company called, or there was a fraternal society called Security Benefit. It's still there, but now it's, a, it's sort of like New York in Topeka. It's a financial firm. And for a few days' wages, a regular Joe, not Joan, but Joe, a regular Joe working there could provide health care for his family for the entire year. They employed their own physicians. They had a clinic. And back then, they let the, I mean, they could like set a bone, you know? So Junior breaks his leg climbing a tree or something. They could even set a bone. They could do stuff like that. These days, what would that cost you? Thousands of dollars, right, for stuff like that. Back then, it was three days' wages, and you're covered. And what happened? Well, a lot of things. 
The AMA got rid of a lot of the medical schools because they wanted to shrink the number of doctors. The IRS came in and said, hey, we're going to tax wages. Okay? And so then the employers respond by saying, okay, well, we're going to give all these side benefits that aren't taxed, and that's how we'll attract talent. Right? Because if we, if we raise your salary, you've got to pay taxes on that. But if we give you health care, health insurance, insurance, health insurance, you don't have to pay taxes on that. So those primo benefits are a big part of the value of that job. And so it kills the fraternal society from a medical point of view. And then the fraternal societies die in general. Because that's something, this is something I said before uh, in one of the previous ones when I was talking about Social Security, right? We get rid of that financial tie between us and our elders, and so all these other ties start to fall away. Same thing. We cut off the financial, you know, very sensible benefit of a health care stuff from a fraternal society, and the fraternal society dies. No wonder. Not surprising. Okay. We're way off, aren't we? Where are we at? <laughs> Sorry. These are, these are the things that just sit in my head my entire life. But you really should read that book. I can't remember. It's, it's published by, like, uh, University of North Carolina Press. It's like 50 bucks on Amazon, but you can get the Kindle for, like, 16. And then you can get a Kindle reader for your laptop for free. So this is my sales pitch. They should hire me, right? I should get a cut. No. So <clears throat> here's my, here, here are a couple of things that I think are great. Um, look, so uh, <laughs> what we need to do is reduce <laughs> participation in the labor force, okay? We need to take that supply curve and just push it up, okay? We need to increase the opportunity cost of work. And how do we do that? Well, we take a page from our friends at American Compass who did this cost of thriving index, and we come up with a number that's sensible. And we say, look, if you have a married household, the feds will pay one of you to not work. Now, is this politically viable? Probably not. One party will have one set of complaints, the other will have another. Okay. And I can already imagine what they are. But I don't really care. I'm in academia, right? We get to talk about, you know, stuff that's never going to happen. Even if we think it should. And so, see, here's the, here's the thing. This is sort of like a self-defeating policy. I think it's really good. We, in the policy world, they talk about sunsetting. It's like, we're going to try a policy for 10 years, and then after that 10th year, we're going to go back to the way things were before. See, I think this is self-sunsetting. We start by paying people to move out of the labor force, and then wages adjust up. We've already kind of seen this with the whole pandemic handout stuff, right? All of this very generous um, unemployment benefits has put massive upward pressure on wages precisely through the same mechanism, precisely through the mechanism of increasing the opportunity cost of labor. We've made it more expensive to work. Why would I work when I've got this much more generous benefit that I don't have to work for? It changes the calculus. So if the feds are going to pay you 30 grand a year to stay home with the kids, I don't know, I think a lot of people would take that. And they'd say, no thanks, Mr. Global Corp. I'm not going to make any more PowerPoints. Bye. And so you see where this is self-defeating. or it, Well, it sunsets itself. Because once the wage gets up high enough for the single earner, we don't have to have the subsidy anymore. Because the wages are high enough. And as long as nobody goes back to work, it's okay. <laughs> Maybe we've got to keep it a little bit, you know, to keep it from going back. But I think this makes sense. Um, another one... Uh, if you look at the, the magazine on my, 
on the, on the Institute's website, leoinstitute.org. Um, there's an article by a Polish gentleman, and he talks about, I, I, believe, the, I believe the edition is called Pro Family Policy. Um, and he talks about this party, this was a couple years ago, this party called Law and Justice. I don't know what it is in Polish. I don't speak Polish. Um, but they said, tell you what, we are going to pay parents $2,700 whenever they have a kid, and we're going to spread that $2,700 out over like a year or two. Okay? And remember, this is Poland. So $2,700 is like five grand here. Okay? <laughs> it's a big difference. Okay? And they're going to have this 40% mortgage deposit guarantee. So they're going to guarantee to the bank 40% of your mortgage. Okay? with the addition of a mortgage payoff based on the number of children per household. So I think the number was if you have three kids, the government just pays your house off. Imagine that. I'm going to be paying on my house until I'm like 60. You know what I mean? And I've got three kids. <laughs> Maybe I can call the Polish government and see, see what they'll do, right? <laughs> no, probably not. <laughs> but isn't that, isn't that an interesting thing for a government to do? So a, a lot of, yeah, a lot of the northern and eastern European countries, yeah, yeah, right. I mean, for them, it's sort of survival. Um, Native-born Austrians will cease to exist in like 2070, if if the things continue as they are. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. So, so it's you know some of these countries you know like Poland and, and Hungary, you know they do this sort of thing. They're also very like vehemently anti-immigration. Okay. So they don't they don't want Germany to tell them that they have to take you know six thousand people every day from North Africa and other places like that. Okay. They want to maintain their culture. Okay. And so some people would say that's you know all kinds of bad names, but, you know, uh, I wouldn't agree. So another thing uh, that I mentioned is, is like, well, I mentioned the, I guess I had it on my slide, the immigration aspect, right? So, you know, it just makes sense that if you constantly have an influx of more and more people into your country, then it's going to pull the supply curve down, okay? It's going to reduce the wage. So that's another problem that you have to, you have to be, uh, sensible about, I think, and sensible in a, in, a, in a in the way that Leo Thirteenth would say it, not sensible in the way that you know somebody in D.C. would have it, right? Um, another thing um, is that firms can participate in this sort of thing. Okay, it doesn't it doesn't have to be the federal government. It doesn't have to be that way. Uh, there's a wonderful company uh, called um, Public Square, and it, the the idea of the company is that they you know, uh, patriotic people sign up on their platform. And so you can patronize businesses that agree with you, you know, politically or whatever. But to give you a flavor for the way they think, they have this $5,000 baby bonus. So if you're an employee there and your family is blessed with a child, they give you five grand, which pretty much with, you know, normal health insurance these days, that would basically cover your entire year's um, you know, out-of-pocket max for a family. That covers almost all of it. It's pretty wild. That's a pretty generous offer, you know. So what's the bottom line here? The just wage should be paid voluntarily by the employer, okay? Employers have a responsibility to their employees. They have, uh, there's, a, there's commutative justice involved here, okay? The justice of two people interacting with each other is involved. And so this is why Leo says it's good that this be an agreed upon thing. And I think those of us that are empowered to do this sort of thing, um, you know, maybe we can figure out a way to inform them of a wage that would actually pay. I think a lot of employers probably know what pays in their area, what it's enough to to live a good life, a normal life, an ordinary life. 
Maybe they don't. In cases where they don't, helping them understand it might help, and they might be willing to make adjustments. If they already know, I think that's where we get some leeway for policy stuff. Okay. In terms of government policy, ensuring a just wage should be about returning labor markets to prior, better conditions. It should focus on ensuring the material prosperity of and an increased formation of families. This is, if you talk to, uh, if you talk to Zoomer guys, okay, one of, the, one of the things that Zoomer guys are worried about is like financially trying to support a family. You know, they're Catholic guys, they wanna be, you know, they wanna be the head of a household. They wanna form a family. But they're like, how do I do it? And there's some statistics out there that show that like the baby boomer generation, by the time they were in like their 20s and 30s, they owned like a third of the wealth of the society at that point. But Gen X, millennials like me, I'm an old millennial. Gen X and millennials, by the time we got into our 30s, it was like 6%. And I tell people this, and, the, and some people are just like, they just don't want to hear it. Like that something has changed. Something is different. Right? If you came of age in the 60s and 70s, the world was a different place. If you're 30 years old in 1975. If you're 30 years old in 2005, it's different. It's even worse if you're 30 years old in 2025. You can't form a family financially, even if you wanted to. Just the means don't exist. Now, some people might say, well, it's just hard work, right? These Zoomer kids don't work. Well, you know, that's precisely what the silent generation said about the boomer gen, right? Every generation says that about the one behind them. So it makes me less amenable to believing that thing. Like, I'm less likely to buy it when everybody says it. I look forward to the day to telling my kid when he's 30, well, you're just a bunch of lazy good-for-nothings, right? I'm just kidding. But it's just the way things are, right? Well, something has actually changed. Something is actually different. The silent gen was able to build a society that they could run. The boomers that had the same opportunities. And then something changed. And we could talk about a lot of things that changed. Immigration policy changed in the 60s. Dra like dramatically changed. So I don't have all the answers, but I got a couple of ideas. Maybe they're good, maybe they're bad. But uh, that's all I have uh, on my sheet here. So thanks for spending time here. This has been a production of the Leonine Institute for Catholic Social Teaching. Thanks for watching. For more information, visit leoinstitute.org.